you so much for this honor to to come here and talk. Uh, I have to admit that I wish that I could visit Delhi in person and be with you in the same room. But you know, uh, Zoom has its own advantages. I'm very, very excited to be here um, and to present this work. Um, so let's begin. Uh, I think that I will share the main questions that we had that Shira and I uh, thought about this book project. And uh, in our research, we ask, why is it important to explore women in combat? What do their experiences teach us? What is the meaning of referring to soldiers and veterans, both as citizens and as violent state actors? When do women soldiers and veterans actively express their voices and when do they silence them? Should we identify them with the state? How do women combatants experience combat trauma? And also, what is the meaning of women's service as combat soldiers for the larger polity and society? We address these questions by exploring the stories and narratives of 100 women who served in combat roles in the military. Each chapter of the book discuss one of these questions. In this talk, we will present a short glimpse of our findings. So what drew us to initiate uh, this study? Um, we know that some of the audience is not from the field. So to give you some background, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with feminist streams in international relations, from the outset, feminist theory has challenged women's near complete absence from traditional international relations theory and practice. And this absence visible um, both in women's marginalization from decision-making and in the assumption that the reality of women's day-to-day -day lives is not impacted by or important to international relations. Beyond this, feminist contributions to IR can also understood through their the construction of gender, both as socially constructed identities and as a powerful organizing logic. This means recognizing and then challenging assumptions about masculine and feminine gender roles that dictates what both women and men should or can do in global or local politics and what counts as important in consideration of international relations. Now, one of the consequences of this stream is making women visible in IR and security studies. And the current book is written in this intellectual context. Now, the 1990s saw women beginning to fill a wider range of roles in the military with bans on women serving in combat roles being gradually relaxed in some countries, a process that is still ongoing. As a result, women are able to fly combat aircraft, serve in artillery units, staff missile emplacements, serve as combat medics, and fill various other roles that involve potential combat exposure. Additionally, many more women are being assigned to combat support roles located on the front line. Yet today, about three decades after the start of these changes, most research on women involved in the military life still concerns itself with widows, the wife of enlisted men, women that were sexually assaulted in the military or women in non-combat related military service. The amount of research about women combatants is growing, but it's still limited. It is thus obvious that women combatants who fulfill assignments in conflict zone and who participate in various armed struggles deserve closer attention in the research arena. Now within the larger debate on military conscription, the dominant gender images of war have been relatively fixed for centuries. Men are the militarists and women are the pacifists or victims. Men are the warriors marching into battle, whereas women march for peace. So when women are involved in the battlefield, their contribution is typically underestimated and underdocumented. In light of this context, the experiences of Israeli women combatants drew our attention and sparked our curiosity. Now I will open with one of the clearest examples about binary conceptions in the military 
and in the sphere of security studies. Several months after one of Israel's military operations, 53 Israel Defense Forces combatants and combat support soldiers were awarded military decorations for exhibiting extraordinary bravery. Now, from a gender perspective, the most noteworthy aspect of these awards was not the fact that only four of the recipients were women, but rather the difference between the justification for the awards given to men and those of the awards to women. Men soldiers were uniformly praised for being brave, actively performing acts of bravery, protecting, and so on. But the women combatants were commended mainly for not panicking. One of the women soldiers who had reportedly spotted armed terrorists trying to infiltrate an Israeli kibbutz was praised for not panicking and immediately informing her commanders. Another women soldier was said to have identified 13 terrorists emerging from a tunnel and similarly did not panic. Thus, with respect to gender, the language of the awards obviously reinforced existing norms. Praiseworthy men combat soldiers are those who show their strong and active nature through acts of bravery, while praiseworthy women combat soldiers are those who overcome their weak and hysterical nature by not panicking. This pattern is not unique to the Israeli case. It reflects the patriarchal norms that still prevailed in military institutions worldwide. One might have expected that so many years after the entry of women into the battlefield as combatants, some of the gender norms informing militaries would have come under considerable strain. However, as we find in our research, women in the military still face a double battle, fulfilling the role as combat soldiers, experiencing combat trauma, and fighting against the state's purported enemies, and at the same time, battle against the patriarchal and masculine nature of the military. Now, let us move to the uh, next point. The binary between hysterical women and brave men is not the only binary conception that exists in the research arena of conflict, violence, and the military. There are binary conceptions in the study of security, in the study of trauma, in the study of protection. It was these binary conceptions that spark our curiosity and led us to embark to the current research while presenting the combatants as narrators that are telling their own story about their military service. Now, one of the first binary conceptions we explore is the heated debate among scholars, including feminist scholars, regarding the meaning of women's participation in the military. In fact, Women's struggle for equal participation in the military is often criticized. Many scholars hold the view that the struggle for equality in the military has this destructive side effects, including the possibility of reinforcing militarism, encouraging the militarization of women's life, and even of bringing about legitimization of the use of force. Some people claim that women should be first of all fighting for peace, and for justice, and only later take care of equality and the military, if at all. Then yet again, decide for women what they should or shouldn't do. Additionally, some observers even claim that the integration of women in the military, particularly into combat roles, have a feminizing and weakening effect in military units. In Israel, some religious groups oppose the incorporation of women to combat units as well, adding more reservation to the discussion. On the other hand, other scholars think that women should integrate into the military in order to gain equality and equal status as in other spheres in life, since military service is one of the most distinctive symbols of full citizenship, especially in societies in, in which military service is dominant and is mandatory just as the service of men in the military often translates into many formal and informal rights in their civilian life, so the exclusion of women from combat roles in the military in many countries is related to their diminished civic status. Yet, irrespective to the academic or perhaps ideological debate, 
since women are indeed currently serving in a variety of combat roles and combat support positions in many countries around the globe, our position is that there is much to be learned from this phenomena about gendered elements of military service and power relations, as well as about alternative interpretation of basic assumption in the field of security and violence. So with regard to the question of identification of the soldiers with the state, we can mention that the soldiers often related to their own society as state, but did not spare criticism from the government. So let us see in the next slide. Okay, so we can see in this slide, today we have a Sigal, uh, one of the first women combat soldiers in the Israeli Defense Forces, she said. Um, now, when I look back, is it actually possible that the prime minister could send us to war with Iran tomorrow? Does anyone really know what he is doing to this country? Does anyone know where he is leading it? So it's really interesting to see that in the interviews with the women uh, who have already completed their military service, we traced expression of criticism, often indirect, of state policy and political decisions, although almost never at the military itself or military personnel. So if we started to talk about the prime minister and about Israel and about these uh, uh, elements, let us move to the next slide and talk a little bit about our case study. Let's talk a little bit about Israel, the context of our research. So the Israeli societies, as, as, as you may know, uh, perceives war and preparations for war as unavoidable processes. Military service for Israeli women became mandatory soon after the creation of the State of Israel, and women comprise one third of the military personnel. Exemptions are given to ultra Orthodox women and Arab women. Plus, when a woman is getting married, she is no longer obligated to serve in mandatory service. She can continue to serve, but it's not mandatory. This rule does not apply to men. In addition, while military service in Israel is compulsory for both women and men, women's service in combat roles is voluntary. Women have had to struggle for the right to join combat units and to fill combat roles, and combat service for women is considered more prestigious than traditional feminine or administrative military roles. Nonetheless, women in combat roles remain the exception rather than the rule, and Israel still lags behind other nations in this respect, and not all roles are open to women. Uh, if we're talking about one third of the military that is comprised of women, in uh, 2015, only 3% of women soldiers served in combat position, whereas now we can talk about 8% of the women in the military are serving in combat units. The numbers are continuing to rise and much more women are serving in combat support positions. So, I have to say that the book does not delve directly into the predicament of Israeli society or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the occupation, the Israeli-Arab conflict per se, but rather focuses on the narration of the experiences of women combatants in the Israel Defense Forces, while well, these conflicts and these contexts is always in the background of their experiences. We thought to present their formative experiences during their military service uh, and their perspective in the military afterlives as civilians in a heavily militarized society. So to talk a little bit about the women that are included in our study, uh, they have been drafted into the military at about the age of 18 and volunteered for combat and combat support roles. And they all served as combatants for a number of years. Uh, half of them were combat support soldiers, half were combat soldiers. And uh, they served on one of Israel fronts, borders or checkpoints in the borders between Israel and Syria, Israel and Lebanon, Israel and the West Bank and Israel and the Gaza Strip. And all interviewees has been exposed to various manifestations of the violent armed conflict between Israel and its neighbors. Um, so what I think I'll do today is um, each chapter of our book focuses on one of the main topics that were dominant in the interviewee's stories, violence and state violence, trauma and combat trauma, 
gender, voice, and silence, their uh, struggle to integrate into the military and so on. So I think that today we will discuss topics that are related to some of these uh, elements, and I will share examples with you of their narratives. So let us start with the issue of their struggle to integrate uh, into combat roles. And uh, uh, we can move to the next slide now. So uh, I think that the soldiers narratives reveals, uh, reveal Jack's positions of feeling and competence and vulnerability and shed light on women's struggle for gender integration in the military. Through the women's narratives, the issues of body and sex gender are addressed alongside variety of ambivalent non-binary descriptions and interpretation of what it means to be feminine or masculine in the military environment and what it means to be a combatant. Now, feminist security studies and feminist uh, theories and in international relations offer an additional perspective on security. These theories hold that wars and conflict should incorporate an analysis of how people have experienced war in many different ways, and not solely by the analysis of state elites or applying the international system level of analysis. As such, given the violence that usually accompanies armed conflict, these studies often center on the embodied person that is on what happens to his or her body and how his or her body functions in war zone. These facets of war experiences and of the combatant's body were reflected in numerous ways in the narratives of the soldiers we interviewed. And um, we will share some of the examples now. During the interviews, the soldiers frequently emphasized their capabilities and their ability to act during warfare and their ability to protect others during combat. Adina, a combat medic, shared with us her experience of evacuating bodies of dead soldiers under fire in one of Israel's operations. And I apologize if it's a bit difficult to hear these uh, narratives because they obviously involve uh, death, injury, and trauma. In these situations, you disconnect yourself. Now, when I look back, I can see myself doing all these things as if I were outside my body. My role as a combat paramedic during my military service involved technical stuff. I had to lift the dead body, prop it up, hold it until we reached the border. There is no one else who can do this. You need to get the corpses out now. Otherwise, imagine what would happen to the soldiers if they saw the friends burned. It's horrible. The goal was to get the bodies out as fast as we could, no matter with which car, no matter how. I did it for the soldiers. They shouldn't see their friends dead. We transfer the bodies like a sack, move the body and move on. Now, in addition to her emphasis on the doing and her need to disconnect in order to function under severe stress and to cope with danger and trauma, Adina's war narrative also sheds new light on the issue of protection. It is interesting to see how combat soldiers position themselves as opposed to other soldiers, eager to protect both combat soldiers and non-combat soldiers. In the interviews, we noted frequent references to the protective elements in women's roles, including both instances in which they protected others and instances in which they resisted being protected by men. Now, protection is a central theme in security studies. Identities of men as protectors and women as protected afford women and men differing access to power and decision-making in the state. As constructed historically, the state's primary duty in the, is the protection of the population from foreign threats, a task carried out usually by men through the rules of designated military service. And women have thus became second-class citizens. Nonetheless, they're expected to be loyal, obedient, and perhaps grateful to their protectors. And they're also expected to take on the role of the carer. The narratives of the women soldiers interviewed in this group project clearly indicated 
that while they do indeed express care, they themselves through the so their actions as protection. Thus, the women soldiers themselves broke the care of protector binary. The act of protection was dominant in their narratives. Continuing to the topic of the body of the female combatants, the interviewees noted ways in which the military was not ready for women's bodies. They described that the equipment was not always suited to their anatomy. Worldwide, several militaries are currently working to design and produce gender-specific gear, but this process is still far from complete, and it is a burning issue. Alongside the description of unsuitable military gear, the women often reflected among themselves about what it means to be a woman in the military and what it means to be feminine in the military. So I can give you some examples. Uh, in the next slide, we can see, for example, Tal that described with frustration the process that she went through. After the entire process of combat training, I became a man. As a combatant, I'm not a strong woman, but a kind of a weak man. Noah, for example, reflected on the complex nature of femininity and masculinity in the military as she understood it. How can I be feminine here? If I look like a man, I behave like a man, I crawl like a man, then am I a woman? I want to develop a different perception of what it means to be feminine. To be feminine doesn't necessarily mean to be gentle and to wear makeup. To be feminine for me is to be strong, to be protective, to be supportive of others. Maybe this is what feminine means. So I give it a different meaning. Noah's view constructed in an interesting way with Tal's comment to the effect that in the army, she became a weak man rather than a strong woman. And Tal's views echoes with the theoretical debate about gender which presumed that to act like a soldier is not to be womanly. The women soldiers who we interviewed grappled with the question of their gendered identities as combatants. And while each of the women we interviewed held their own particular interpretation of the role she ought to have assumed as a combatant, all interviewees acknowledged that the system demanded that they will become more masculine. Most express a certain tension between the desire to meet this expectation on the one hand and the resistance to it on the other. Another aspect of the women combatants' integration into combat roles was related to how men in the same roles treated them. Alongside with the description of, of men who did indeed support the women combatants, a recurring theme in the interviews related to men soldiers who disregarded and underestimated the women in combat, expressed the discomfort with women officers and with women in combat roles. Tal, a woman combatant, described the double standard applied to women and men combatants. When you are tough, you're considered a bitch. You're not considered strong. No, you are a bitch. Whereas a man behaves at the same way, everyone says, what a man, but you, you're just a whore. Rotem, a combatant, spoke about her frustration when men were picked for a certain operational role instead of her. I was very successful in the physical training. I was ranked second in everything, except for one guy. I was ahead of all the guys. Yet when there was a security operation, they picked the guys and not me. I was frustrated. I'm talented. I'm athletic. I shoot well, and I'm not appreciated enough. The ex-combatants admitted that they encountered the same double standards in civilian life. In the book, we expose a wide spectrum of interpretations of what it means to be women combatant and how the women in combat support roles coped with these dilemmas. I would like to, to move along with uh, their narratives and along with the emphasis on their capabilities and their ability to fulfill the combat duties during warfare, one of the important aspects that was brought to us by the combatants is the issue of trauma. To set up the framing of the subject, I would clarify that historically, 
research on human-induced trauma and its aftermath began with Freud in response to the combat distress of men combatants. This research was later complemented by studies of the trauma of women and children as abused victim. Current knowledge about trauma, therefore, stems from studies on combat men and victim women. And combat and combat trauma are still often treated in the empirical categories of men versus women. By focusing on the narratives of women combatants, our analysis breaks with the traditional ways in which war-associated trauma have been studied. We suggest that certain aspects of trauma can be understood through the study of women exposed to combat trauma as perpetrators, as victims, or as both. Our study therefore moved beyond the gender dichotomy as well as beyond the hero narratives of war to explore narratives by the women soldiers and veterans that were out there making war. In parallel, we also exposed narrative of potentially traumatic events that were not necessarily narratives of PTSD. The nature of the traumatic events experienced by the women soldiers um, included exposure to death, threatened death, injury, and so on. And I apologize in advance for some difficult descriptions. I'll give you some examples. Debbie descriptions of her experience as a combat medic capture the kinds of challenges and traumatic effects common to women combatants and women in combat support rooms. So let's read a, a, at least a part of it. I remember I didn't feel a thing. Before that, I had to pee. And when, I, when they brought the dead bodies and the wounded soldiers, I didn't feel anything. I didn't think about anything. I didn't have to pee anymore. I felt a mixture of stuff. And there was the smell. I, re I remember the smell. I smell it now. A burned body has a weird smell and so on. I smell it only from dead bodies. I remember I didn't feel anything afterwards. One of the men combat medics puked and another one was nauseous. I ignored it and kept on doing stuff, taking care of them, like it wasn't a part of my life. This interview with you is the first time I'm telling about the bodies, as if it's not a part of my life right now. Presenting women soldiers as narrator of their own experiences, as in Debbie's case, hold the potential to expose various overlooked aspects of trauma. Moreover, instead of moving directly to statistics and symptoms of distress, PTSD, and psychopathology, we suggest that researchers and the public has to focus on detailed description of potentially traumatic events. The combat soldiers who we interviewed often expressed the need to set aside their emotion in order to function during their military service. I'll, I'll give you one more example. Ella, a combat support soldier, described witnessing a friend being killed. And I'll, I'll skip most of the parts. A minute ago, we were talking near the cafeteria of the base. He sat right next to my body. A minute later, he was gone. Not only that, I saw with my own eyes how he was killed on the war room screens. You see that and you cannot cry. You just cannot cry. And seeing a friend killed, Ella's body reacted. She wanted to cry, but she was not able to cry. Her response can be understood in the context of the military environment whose gender norms did not allow her to cry. In her combat-related role, she needed to act like a man. Ella described the inconceivable and sudden contrast between the experience of being close to her friend and his violent death and subsequent absence. There is an immense value in studying the responses to traumatic events and in the context of the combatants narratives. For example, Debbie had been able to bring back the smell of the dead bodies only during the interview with us. Recollections, she said, that have not been a part of her life until we asked her about her experience. Now, this is not the only factor that motivates us to research in detail experience that comprise women's trauma. 
Women who enter combat roles have to cope with both physical and mental difficulties deriving to their exposure to combat, life-threatening events, death, and other traumatic events. And in addition, they have to cope with gender division and hegemonic masculinity in the military. Most of the interviewees were appreciative that we asked them about their experiences and acknowledged how important it was to talk about these experiences. Yet these combat soldiers, of course, should not be regarded as a homogeneous group since they experience these elements uh, differently. Combat trauma was prevalent both among combat soldiers and among combat support soldiers. And it's very, very, I think, important to talk about this. Listening to the mosaic of traumatic narratives of combat women exposes the reality in the front line. Most of the women interviewed mentioned that they continued their combat roles along with frequent potentially traumatic events that they experienced. Exposing the interviews is important both on a personal level and on a sociopolitical level. I think that societies have long avoided listening to stories about combat trauma, preferring to deal instead with heroes, numbers, perhaps laundered statistics and so on, and laundered language. And uh, I think that truly listening to war stories can be devastating, but it's really, really important for societies that have responsibilities that are sending the soldiers to the battlefield. I think I would like to uh, sum up with perhaps more positive element of uh, the interviews. And I would like to move to discuss shortly their transition to civil life. War and military service are acknowledged as enabling the young male to become a man. What then is war for combat women? Following this line of thought, one should ask, what can we say about the so-called reverse process of becoming a civilian again? What is the nature of this process for women veterans? To understand the multiple ways in which women's militarized subjectivities are constructed, it is necessary to disaggregate the different groups of women in the military and to differentiate between women who have constricted into mandatory military service and those who served as professional militaries or volunteer forces. Overall, to engage with experiences of war and political violence, one should not hesitate to explore and to listen carefully to the combatants' voices. The narratives of the combat soldiers about their discharge from the military and subsequent transitioning to civilian life vary from interviewee to interviewee. A substantial number of women veterans told us they moved naturally, occasionally with some minor shock into their civilian life upon completing their mandatory service. The fact that the majority of Israeli young adults, women and men alike, follow a similar path might serve as a supporting mechanism for these veterans. So as the women combat soldiers who we interviewed repeatedly emphasized, when they re-entered civilian life, even if only for a weekend break from the military service, they struggle with patriarchal norms. Even though they carried with them the war experiences and they were well aware of their capabilities. Adina, a combatant recounted the following exchange with her father after she told him about her involvement in an operational activity very deep in enemy territory. Let's see what she says. My dad told me, how did they let you do that? I don't believe they let my daughter do that. And I said to him, what do you mean let me? I chose to do that. He was very upset that I went into the battlefield into enemy territory during an operation. And I told him, what about my brother and my cousins? They also went into enemy territory. And my father replied, no, it's not the same. It's not the same. Adina was certain that she was the best candidate to do this dangerous job, but her father disregarded her ability. Many combatants shared that others were surprised and skeptical about their involvement in combat we gain a different perspective from Susanna uh, and her reflection on her service. She said, I am a combatant. It is, in my view, proof 
that I can do anything in life. Since if I, can, if I did this, is there anything I cannot do? Until today, I'm very proud of this. I wouldn't change it for the world. So if I'd like to conclude, and that was really a, a tiny piece of our research, uh, I think that uh, uh, the research in general on the double battle faced by women combatants in conflict zones as soldiers and as women illustrates the complexities of their status. In their narratives, the women describe more challenges and struggle that we covered here today, and they discussed moral complexities of their service in particular and challenges of serving in a military that controls civilian population. They brought us diverse voices and interpretation of their status and their roles. And into this complex situation, gender elements entered. They had to cope with sexual harassment and they um, had to cope with gender stereotypes and some resistance from their male counterparts during their service. Now, integrating women into the military does indeed promote gender equality. But at the same time, it involves a militarization of women's lives and situates them at the front line of making war and causing violence. UN Security Council Resolution 1325 recognizes women's right to participate as decision makers at all levels in conflict prevention, conflict resolution, and peace building processes, and also recently in peace keeping operations. The call for women's integration into the military in combat and combat support roles further support the somewhat controversial right uh, uh, to move on uh, uh, and, and to, to integrate. And this is a very, very difficult uh, question here. Now, I think that in this talk, I had the opportunity um, indeed to, to present a small piece of our findings. And in the book itself, we elaborate much more about each theme. And returning to the, the construction of binary conceptions, we take the position that women should be viewed as capable and vital actor in armed conflict rather than merely passive victims. Likewise, soldiers and veterans should not be described as either pacifists or militaries. There are many perspectives along this continuing. And our study opens a call for scholars to probe further into the meaning uh, and interpretation of women's presence in today's battlefield. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to present a small piece of my work here.